Hello, I'm Elaine. For the next hour, I'm going to be showing you how easy it is to knit sweaters like these on a knitting machine. You're probably thinking that it's rather difficult, but believe me, it's not. Just follow the simple steps I'll be showing you and study the operation and knitting manuals. And in no time at all, you'll be knitting beautiful sweaters of your own. Now let's learn the basic procedures and techniques by knitting this particular pullover as an example. Although it seems quite easy, it would be a good idea to pay close attention. Before we actually start knitting, let's learn a little bit about the knitting machine. First of all, we set up the machine correctly following the instructions in the operation manual, otherwise we will not be able to knit properly. It would be a good idea at this point to memorize the names and functions of each part. This is the carriage and this is its arm. The carriage is the part that is moved back and forth while knitting. The carriage has various levers as well as a stitch dial for controlling the stitch size. This dial is adjusted according to the thickness and type of yarn you are using, which, of course, is completely up to your preference. The higher the number on the stitch dial, the larger the stitch size. This cam lever is for selecting the type of stitch. On both sides of the carriage are the rustle levers, side levers, intarsia levers and the weaving knobs. These should be set according to the instructions in your manual. Here we have the latch needles which move back and forth along the needle groove. These needles knit or do not knit according to the needle positions and the setting of the rustle levers. The letters A, B, C, D on both ends of the needle bed represent the needle positions used while knitting. The letter A is the resting or non-knitting position. B is the position for stockinette and other stitch patterns, depending on the setting of the cam lever. The C position is for stockinette. The needles in this position knit back to the B position and D is the holding position with the rustle levers at 1. When the rustle levers are at 2 in this position, the needles knit back to the B position. This is the knit contour. Inserting the pattern paper and the knit contour will give you a good guide as to when to cast on or off and as to how many stitches to be increased or decreased as you're knitting the garment. I'll explain some of the other parts like the auto tension and the pattern panel as we're knitting the pullover. Of course, you can use thin or thick yarns on this machine, but we recommend you start with a medium yarn until you become accustomed to knitting with it. This table shows the suggested stitch dial number for each type of yarn. When knitting in stockinette, you should refer to this table. However, to find the suitable tension for the different stitch patterns, you must first make a test swatch. By the way, there are three types of knitting machines. Each is designed with different needle sizes and needle spacing for various kinds of knitting work. With this variety, you can enjoy knitting garments with nearly any type of yarn you'd like. Now, let's learn how to knit our ladies' pullover step by step. I'll begin by explaining how to cast on and knitting in stockinette. Following the instructions in the operation manual, 
Thread the yarn through the auto tension. Prepare the yarn correctly and remember to use the type described in the manual or cone type yarn. Remember, hand wound ball and skein yarns should not be used. Next, align the needles in the working position. Do this by first pushing the needles to the D position. Set the carriage as the manual shows and then move it across the needle bed until it passes the needles in the D position. With this, the needles will move back to the B position. At this point, the carriage should be returned to the right side. Now, using the one stroke one side of the needle pusher, push every second needle from the B position to D. Next, we set both of the weaving knobs to the weaving mark you see here and the stitch dial to the number that matches the yarn you selected. Then thread the yarn through the yarn feeder. Pull the yarn end from underneath the arm and lay it over all the needles in the D position. Following this, slowly move the carriage and knit three to four rows. Now, cast on is complete. The next step is to reset the weaving knobs and side levers and then knit another five to six rows. Hang claw weights at both ends of the fabric and move the carriage from side to side for knitting in stocking net. It is important to move the carriage at an even speed while holding it with a firm but light grip. Remember to never reverse the carriage's movement in the middle of a row. Always move it past all the needles in the working position. It's very important to take a correct tension gauge to ensure that your garment is the correct size. The tension gauge tells you how many stitches you need for cast on and how many rows you'll need to knit a 10 centimeter square. To take a correct tension gauge, a swatch must be knitted in the same stitch pattern and with the same yarn and the same stitch dial number as the garment you're knitting. Arrange 35 needles on both sides of the center point zero and then cast on. Now set the row counter to zero and knit 20 rows at the stitch dial number you plan to use for your garment. Next, exchange the main yarn in the yarn feeder for the contrast yarn and knit two rows. And then, exchange once again and knit 30 rows with the main yarn. Take the 21st needle on both sides of the center and push them into the D position. Then place a piece of contrast yarn in each of their hooks for marking and push the needles back to the B position by hand. At this point, knit another 30 rows with the main yarn, followed by two rows with the contrast yarn, and then 20 more rows with the main yarn. Now, remove the yarn from the yarn feeder 
and move the carriage across the fabric to remove it from the machine. Since the swatch was stretched sideways on the machine, you should take it and roll it into a tube from side to side and then pull it lengthways to close up the stitch. Press the swatch according to the yarn manufacturer's instructions while taking care not to press too firmly. Read the number within the marks on the gauge scale. When measuring stitches, use the scale with the S side facing up. Place the end with the arrow on the inside of the leftmost contrast stitch and measure to the inside of the rightmost contrast stitch. As you can see, we get a reading of 30 stitches for our tension swatch. When measuring rows, use the gauge scale with its R side facing up. Place the arrow end at the top of the tension swatch just below the rows knitted with the contrast yarn and measure to the inside of the contrast rows at the bottom of the swatch. Our reading in this case is 41 rows. It would be wise to make a note of the stitch dial number and tension gauge. This is the pattern paper set, a handy feature which makes knitting very easy for anyone. All you have to do is pick your favorite style from the 17 different pattern styles and then set the pattern paper into the knit contour. We will use this particular pattern paper to knit our pullover. To determine your size, take body measurements as shown here in the table and select the most suitable size. In this case, you take a bust measurement and choose size A, B, C, D, E or F. For the pullover we're knitting here, I've randomly selected size C. Now take the other measurements shown on the pattern paper's measurement table and check them against your selected pattern size. Should your body measurements be significantly different from the patterns, or should you want to change the length or what have you, you can adjust the pattern in this manner. Our next step is to set up the knit contour. Select the stitch scale with a number that matches the one you measured for your tension swatch and insert it into the stitch scale clip. We then must set the change dial to the stop setting in order to set the row number dial to the same number as the tension swatch. Next, since the pattern we're using here is a half scale, we set the select lever to one half. Now set the pattern paper as shown in your knitting manual. At this time, make sure you have the pattern paper's center line aligned with center zero of the stitch scale. Turn the feeding dial in the R direction until the pattern paper starting line shows just above the stitch scale. With this, you are ready to begin knitting. Now at last we can start knitting the pullover. First of all, we'll knit the back, the front, the sleeves and the neckband separately and then put them all together after we've finished. I'll begin by explaining how to knit the back. This is how the back looks after it's completed. Since the welt is knitted afterwards, we shall begin by knitting above the welt in knit one, purl one, rib. Set the pattern paper for the back and lock it in above the welt line. The number shown where the contour line intersects with the stitch scale is the number of stitches you need for cast on. <laughs> 
Arrange your needles on each side of center zero according to this number. And then cast on and knit five to six rows with waist yarn of a different color from your main yarn. This is what we call waist knitting and it's something we normally do on a knitting machine before knitting a garment or before removing fabric from it. Since we remove this piece after we finish knitting, it does not affect your garment's finished measurement in any way. After you have done a few rows of waist knitting, knit one row with ravel cord to separate it from the main knitting. To knit a row of ravel cord, thread the cord through the yarn feeder, one, then while holding it lightly by hand above the yarn feeder, slowly move the carriage. When doing waist knitting, the change dial should be set to this position in order to keep the pattern paper from moving. Needless to say, you must reset the dial to the original setting before you begin to work on your garment. Next, you set the carriage for stocking net and the stitch dial to the number you determined with your tension swatch and then begin knitting with your main yarn. You'll see that with every row you knit, the pattern paper moves one row. You can continue knitting up to the armhole without having to do any shaping. For shaping the armhole, you must knit up to the shoulder by decreasing the stitches on both sides of the fabric. You can do this by simply following the contour lines. All you do is decrease the number of stitches on the needle bed according to the number shown at the point where the contour line meets the stitch scale. Should you need to decrease more than two stitches at a time, you can only do it on the carriage side. Just use a transfer tool and take the end stitch over to its adjacent needle. Then push the empty needle back to the A position and the second needle to the D position until both stitches are behind the latch. Next, you place the yarn in the open needle hook and push the needle back to the B position while holding the yarn down slightly. Do this for the number of stitches you need decreased and then place the last decreased stitch onto the adjacent needle. Now, knit one row and do the same shaping procedure for the other armhole. When your knitting calls for decreasing one stitch on both sides of the same row, this is how you do it. Again, using the transfer tool, take and place the end stitch onto the adjacent needle and push the empty needle back to the A position. While decreasing stitches, you should use the claw weight to prevent the edge from becoming too tightly knitted. Likewise, you should hold your knitting against the machine to prevent your stitches from dropping. Bringing out the end needle to the D position also keeps the decreased stitch from slipping out. Shaping the shoulders of the garment requires partial knitting by decreasing the stitches while following the contour line up to the back neck edge. You should use this method when the number of stitches to be decreased is greater than the total number of rows knitted. First, read the number of stitches to be decreased on the knit contour. Next, push the required number of needles to the D position on the opposite side of the carriage. <laughs> 
set both rustle levers to one. Then knit one row. Now pass the yarn under the first inside needle in the D position and then over the other needles. This is to prevent the possibility of a hole from being formed in your fabric. Then, after moving the required number of needles to the D position on the opposite side of the carriage, we knit one row. This completes the first step in partial knitting. Knit up to the back neckline using the partial knitting method on both the left and right in an alternating fashion. Remember to hang the claw weights on both sides of the fabric where the needles are in the B position. Also, you must always move the needles to the D position on the opposite side of the carriage. On the other hand, if you move the needles on the carriage side to the D position, the yarn will become crossed over the needles like this. From the back neckline, knit the right and left shoulders separately. If you have the carriage on the right side, knit the right shoulder first. To do this, move the needles for the left shoulder and the back neckline centre straight section to the D position in order to hold the stitches in place and then proceed to knit the right shoulder. While partial knitting the shoulder, shape the back neckline by following the contour line and by decreasing the stitches as you did with the armhole. After you have finished the right shoulder, push the needles for the section to the C position and knit five to six rows with waist yarn. Then remove the section from the machine. Be sure to push the empty needles back to the A position. Now return the pattern paper to the beginning of the back neckline and reset the change dial to the stop setting. Next, put your yarn mark at center zero. Push the needles for the back neckline center straight section to the C position and knit five to six rows with waist yarn. Again, remove the section from the machine and push the empty needles back to the A position. At this time, reset the change dial to its original setting and knit the left shoulder. Of course, everything is exactly the same, except that shaping will now be reversed. Now the back is all completed except for the welt, which, as I said before, will be knitted in knit one purl one rib later on. <laughs> Well then, now we can begin with the front of our pullover. The front side will be knit in stocking knit and fair isle. With fair isle, we use two different coloured yarns at the same time. First of all, we select one of the standard punch cards that come with the machine. For our pullover, I've selected the number 10 card. Next, we select a different colour yarn for contrast, and then we're ready to give fair isle knitting a try. We start with the punch card, each of which can be used in four different ways. A, 
B, C, or D. For the pullover we're making, we'll use A, the basic pattern. First, set the punch card into the insertion slot exactly as the operation manual instructs. Then, set the card at pattern row number one and lock it. And knit one row in stockinette so that the carriage can memorize the pattern. Following the instructions in the operation manual, set the carriage for fair isle and release the card to begin knitting. Then, as shown here, change the yarn by threading the white yarn through yarn feeder 1 and the blue yarn through yarn feeder 2. If you have problems getting a proper end stitch, move the end needle on the carriage side to the D position before knitting the row. With the needle in this position, and the cam lever set at fair isle, only the yarn in yarn feeder 2 will be knitted. Make sure that you've moved the carriage completely past the touch levers so that it can memorize the pattern for the next row. This is important because if you move the carriage back before then, the pattern will not be memorized correctly. The perforated parts of the punch card controls the yarn in yarn feeder 2, whereas the non-perforated parts are for the yarn in yarn feeder 1. We first knit a swatch with about 60 rows of fair isle and a few rows of stockinette and then remove it from the machine. With this we can get a good idea of the size of the pattern on the front of our pullover. Now then, Begin by marking your starting position on the pattern paper for pattern knitting of the front. Since the tension gauge for fair isle is nearly identical to stockinette when the stitch dial is set at the same number, keep the same knit contour setting. However, if you are using a tuck stitch, slip stitch, punch lace or others, you must take a separate tension gauge. Set and lock the pattern paper for the front at the line above the welt, just as you did for the back. Now, set and lock the punch card at pattern row number one. Next, knit up to the pattern knitting position the same way as you did for the back. You're now all set to start knitting in fair isle with the punch card. Take the white and blue yarns and thread them through the yarn feeder as you see here. After this, set the carriage for fair isle, release the card and then knit in fair isle up to the armhole shaping. To shape the armhole, Decrease the stitches on both sides of the fabric by following the contour line. When decreasing two or more stitches at a time in fair isle, you must take the end stitch and transfer it onto the adjacent needle. Push the second needle to the D position and then lay the yarn you're working with into the open hook. After you've completed pattern knitting, remove both yarns from their respective positions in the yarn feeder, thread the blue yarn where the white yarn was, and then knit up to the front neckline in stocking net. We must knit the right and left sides separately from the neckline. The front, unlike the back, must be shaped in sections. Therefore, we must use a different method of holding stitches.
The reason for this is that there are too many rows to knit from the beginning of the neckline to the shoulder sections. So the fabric may become askew, or even worse, ruined. To avoid this, we must remove the sections to be held from the machine with waist knitting and then continue knitting on the carriage side. Your yarn mark should be at the center of the front neckline. Now, following the contour line, decrease stitches to shape the front neckline and do partial knitting to shape the shoulder. After you've finished the first section, knit about five to six rows with waist yarn and then remove the section from the machine. The next step is to return the pattern paper to the beginning of the front neckline and take the last row of stitches from the other front section being held in place and put them back onto the original needles. When you do this, make sure to firmly push the needles with stitches to the B position to keep the stitches from slipping out. After you've placed all the stitches, remove the waist knitting. We knit this section in the same manner, except now our shaping is done in reverse. This completes the front of our pullover. Again, the welt will be knitted in knit one purl one rib later on. Now that we've got the front and the back done, let's move on to the sleeves. We'll begin with the right sleeve, which is knit in stocking net, followed by the left sleeve, which is knit in stocking net, and fair isle. First, set the pattern paper for the sleeve into the knit contour and lock it at the line above the cuff. Next, we do our usual waist knitting for about five to six rows and then commence knitting with our main yarn. Again, we follow the contour line, but this time we must increase the stitches to shape the underarm. We will use a fully fashioned increasing method to shape the underarm. This particular method makes joining easier by blind stitch. The sleeve cap is shaped in the same manner as the armhole. You just decrease stitches while following the contour line. Put your yarn mark at the center of the sleeve cap. Then cast off the remaining stitches at the top of the sleeve cap as you would when decreasing multiple stitches and remove it from the machine. Now we mark our starting position on the pattern paper for pattern knitting of the left sleeve. Set and lock the same punch card you used for the front at pattern row number one. And then set your pattern paper and knit up to the pattern knitting position just like you did for the right sleeve. Then knit in fair out the same way as the front. Once again, 
follow the contour line and shape the underarm with a fully fashioned increasing stitch method. We then shape the sleeve cap by decreasing stitches in the same manner as we did for the front armhole. After completing pattern knitting, continue knitting the sleeve cap in stockinette and then cast off the remaining stitches. Now we've completed both of our sleeves. The cuffs, like the welts, will be knitted later in knit one, purl one rib. <laughs> Before we start knitting the welts and cuffs, we must lightly press each piece. This is because the fabric at this point has not settled into its correct sizing and still has a tendency to curl in on both sides. I can't emphasize how important it is to press the fabric before we begin the joining process. Pin each piece according to size onto an ironing board and then give it a light press. Now we knit the back welt in knit one purl one rib. We start by setting the pattern paper for the back at the starting line of the welt. Push the required number of needles to the B position, then pick up all the stitches from the first row of your main knitting and place them onto these needles with the reverse side of the back facing towards you. Now set the stitch dial two numbers lower than the original tension swatch reading in order to make the rib stitch tighter. Likewise, you must also reset the number of rows to about a 10% higher setting than the tension gauge reading for stocking knit. You can now go ahead and knit the required number of rows. To make the knit one purl one rib, you then take your tappet tool and reform every other stitch in the following manner. Insert the tappet tool into the stitch from the front of the fabric at the point where ribbing will begin. Next, remove the stitch from its needle and unravel it. You then hook the yarn with the tappet tool above the stitch and pull it towards you while pulling the fabric downwards with your free hand. You repeat this for each loop of yarn up to the top stitch, which is then placed back on the needle. Repeat this procedure until you have finished reforming. You should leave the end of the yarn about three times longer than the width of the back welt for closing up the last stitches. Now for setting the carriage. Move the cam lever to slip, the side levers to the dot mark, and the Russell levers to number two setting. Push the needles with the reformed stitches to the D position, then knit one row with waist yarn. Reset the cam lever to stockinette and knit five to six rows. Now remove the fabric. Pull the ravel cord out to remove the waist knitting at the beginning of the back. <laughs> 
and then knit the front welt and cuffs as you did the back welt. Since the cuff is narrower than the sleeve, we must pick up and place the stitches in the following manner. Push the required number of needles to the B position. Then pick up the stitches from the first row of the sleeve's main knitting and place them onto the needles in the B position in order to decrease stitching to fit the cuff. OK, so now that we've got the front, back and sleeves all knitted, let's put them together. First let me give you the order in which we'll be doing the joining procedure. We will begin by joining the front and back sections of the right shoulder. Knit the neckband in knit one, purl one rib. Close the last row of stitches for the welts, cuffs and neckband and then join the left shoulder sections. This will be followed by joining both ends of the neckband and the side seams of the back and front by blind stitch. We will then join the underarm seams and finally set the sleeves. Now then, let's get started by putting our pullover together step by step. We begin with the right shoulder. Push the same number of needles as the number of shoulder stitches to the B position. Pick up the main yarn stitches of the back section of the shoulder with the right side facing you and place them onto these needles. Then pick up the main yarn stitches of the front section of the shoulder with the opposite side facing you and place them onto the same needles. Next we unravel the waist knitting for both right shoulder sections. Now push the needles to the D position. While holding the back shoulder section against the machine so the stitches move behind the latches. At this time, the stitches for the front section of the shoulder should still be in the needle hooks. You then push the needles back to the B position so that the stitches behind the latches slip off the needles and over the stitches in the hooks. Now you must close the stitches with the back stitch method using the tapestry needle and remove the fabric from the machine. Our next task is to knit the neckband. We first set the pattern paper at the starting line for the neckband. We must exchange the stitch scale for one with a 10% higher number than the one we used for knitting in stocking knit. Set the stitch dial and row number dial at the same setting we used for the welt. Push the required number of needles for the neckband to the B position. And with the reverse side of the front and back facing you, Pick up the stitches evenly from the neck edge and place them onto the needles in the B position. Now knit the neckband as you did for the welts and cuffs. That completes your neckband. Now let's close the last row of stitches on the back welt.
Using the tapestry needle, insert the yarn into the first stitch from the front. And then from the front again, guide the yarn into the second stitch. Next, take the yarn back to the first stitch from the back and then over to the third stitch. Go to the second stitch again and then pull out the yarn at the fourth stitch. After you have done this procedure for all the stitches, you then unravel the waist knitting. With the back welt now completed, we then use the same method to close up the last stitches of the front welt, cuffs and neckband. Now for joining the left shoulder sections, which is identical to what we did for the right. Next, I will explain the blind stitch method of joining the side seams, both ends of the neckband and the underarm seams. We begin by threading a tapestry needle with our main yarn. With the right side of the fabric facing you, pick up each sinker loop between the last two stitches of the edge. Do this for every other row and then pull the yarn tight to close up the stitches. Now we've come to setting in the sleeves. Place two lines of stitching along the top of the sleeve cap. Then draw the threads just enough to fit the sleeve cap to the armhole. Next we pin the sleeve in the armhole at close intervals, taking care to match the underarm seam to the side seam and the yarn mark of the sleeve cap to the shoulder seam. We then do a short stitch basting. Now we set the sleeve with the slip stitch method using a crochet hook and our main yarn. Starting from the underarm seam, insert the crochet hook into each loop, catch the yarn and pull it through. Do this along the entire line of basting stitches. When you have finished, remove all the basting. Although we have now joined all the pieces, we are not quite done. There are still a few finishing touches left. We should sew in the yarn ends to make them invisible. And then I recommend a final light pressing. Now our ladies pullover is completed. I hope that what I have shown you here will help you on your way to knitting many of your own wonderful creations. Remember, when you're not sure of something, always go back to your manuals. What you see here is a ribbing attachment.
Along with your knitting machine, it makes knitting rib stitches and other types of stitches extremely easy. I'd like to briefly show you how you would use it in knitting the pullover we've just finished. First, let's set up the ribber according to the instructions in the ribbing attachment instruction book. Make sure the yarn rod is set up at the opposite angle from when we are using the knitter only. The welt of this pullover was knitted with this time-saving attachment. The ribber allows you to knit both the front and the back starting from the welt. Now then, let me explain to you how to knit a knit one purl one rib with this ribber. Set the half pitch lever to P for knit one purl one rib and the swing indicator to P5. First push the required number of needles to the D position on the knitter needle bed and then push every other needle back to the A position. Next push the ribber's needles to the D position, arranging them so that they alternate with the knitter's needles. Set both stitch dials at the zero setting and then move the carriage once or twice to align the needles in the B position, making sure you complete the movement with the carriage on the left side. Next, thread the yarn through the yarn feeder knit one row and then suspend the cast on comb with weights. Now set both carriages according to the instructions in the manual and knit three rows. With this, cast on is complete. then reset the carriages. Now you can begin knitting in knit one, purl one rib. As you can see, the ribber makes it very quick and simple to knit rib stitches. After all, you never have to cast on with waist yarn and you never have to reform stitches by hand. Now then, let's try using it to knit the back. We start by knitting a tension swatch in knit one purl one rib and by taking a tension gauge in the same manner as in stocking knit. Then we insert the pattern paper for the back and lock it in at the starting line of the welt. The stitch scale we use should be the same number as the tension gauge for stocking knit. The row number is set according to the tension gauge setting for knit one, purl one rib. The next step is to arrange the required number of needles on both needle beds for knit one, purl one rib. Followed by casting on the main yarn, releasing the pattern paper and finally knitting the required number of rows for the welt.
Now we transfer the ribber stitches onto the corresponding knitter needles using the double eye transfer tool. Release the ribber carriage from the ribber arm and by depressing the drop levers twice, lower the ribber bed to its lowest position. Then remove the weights and cast on comb from the fabric. Next, we exchange the ribber arm for the knitters. Reset the stitch dial and row number and then knit back just as you would when using the knitter only. You knit the front welt exactly the same way as the back, likewise for the neckband and the cuffs. Of course the sleeves are knitted without the ribber. However, for the neckband and cuffs, you must knit five to six rows with waist yarn and then remove the fabric from the machine. After doing this, join the neckband to the neck edge and the cuffs to the sleeves on the machine. Well, there you have it. You must realize though that I've only explained the basic procedures of knitting on your machine. The possibilities are virtually endless and learning them can make knitting something you will enjoy for years to come. Also, by using the cam lever and the many varieties of punch cards available, you can enjoy knitting in a wide selection of stitch patterns, including Fair Isle, Single Motif, tuck stitch, slip stitch, punch lace, weaving, intarsia and much much more. And when you've learned everything there is to know about the basics, why not try your hand at your own creations? <laughs>